Approaching Keats's poetry for the first time can be bewildering. The words are deliberately archaic, the lines are cloyed with references to wine, fruit and roses, and Keats expects his reader to have a working knowledge of classical mythology. Since Keats prioritised the beauty and rhythm of his language over its clarity, the plot of the narrative poems can be difficult to follow. Points of action are lost in dazzling and ornate description. This video intends to simplify matters by discussing three vital themes that can be used as starting points to explore and interpret many of his poems. Those themes are 1. Escaping the Industrial Age, 2. The Imagination, and 3. Desire and Death. I will use the start, middle and end of the Eve of St Agnes to exemplify each of these themes in turn, but will draw in other poems by Keats where applicable. So let's begin. In the last video on Keats's life and legacy, we learnt that Keats was part of the Romantic movement that rebelled against the rational Age of Enlightenment. At this point, another factor needs bringing into the equation. The Enlightenment's focus on technology and progress had also paved the way for the Industrial Revolution. This revolution was the birth of the Western world as we know it. A great series of leaps in the manufacturing trade, from new ways of producing iron to the increased use of steam power, transformed almost every aspect of British life. The bulk of the working class shifted from tilling the fields and farms of the countryside to labouring alongside powerful machines in urban factories. It was the dawn of a new age, an age defined by coal, steam and iron. Romanticism was thus not only a reaction to the Age of Enlightenment, but to the Industrial Revolution. Britain may have become the workshop of the world, but something had been lost in the process. A connection to beauty, humanity, the spiritual self and the natural world. The Romantics were highly critical of industrial life and attacked its commercial values in their poetry. In Isabella or the Pot of Basil, Keats describes the villainous brothers like greedy 19th century industrialists. He writes, For them many a weary hand did swelt in tortured mines and noisy factories. On the whole, however, Keats was less concerned with launching direct attacks on the industrial age and more concerned with escaping from it. I have cheated slightly in calling escaping the industrial age a theme when it's closer to a driving factor, a romantic impetus that lies behind many core elements of Keats's poetry. While modernity waged war on the natural world, scarring the landscape with train tracks and coal pits, Keats venerated the natural world, turning to trees, flowers, animals and the seasons. While the Industrial Revolution reduced people to mindless cogs, no different from the machines they worked with, Keats examined our sensible ability to touch, taste, smell, hear and see. And, of course, Keats escaped his own era by turning to the classical or medieval one. Some of his greatest works are set in a mythical version of the Middle Ages, filled with knights and ladies, magic and enchantment. In the opening three stanzas of The Eve of St Agnes, the natural, sensual and medieval join together to create a perfect escape from the industrial age. The narrative poem tells the story of Porphyro and his beloved lady, Madeline. Their two families are bitter enemies, and thus, over the course of the poem, Porphyro sneaks into the castle where Madeline resides, and the lovers run away together into the night. At the beginning of the poem, Keats puts the natural world at the fore. The reader is placed outside of the castle and the setting shimmers in a state of wintry pause. The iciness of the air is conveyed through the animal world, from the ineffectual feathers of the owl to the trembling of the hare to the silence of the flock. All is cold and quiet until the poem begins to zoom towards the castle. We follow the beadsman through the chapel, a door and up three steps until he can hear the sound of musical instruments. The sound is described as music's golden tongue, a striking image that personifies music and appeals to our sense of hearing, sight and, arguably, taste. Keats thus suggests the all-consuming nature of the melody as it washes over the beadsman and causes him to weep. 
The presence of the beadsman also alerts the reader to the pseudo-medieval setting of the piece. There is an unmistakable air of magic to the legendary castle, a fairy tale palace filled with sensual music and suspended in a landscape of deathly frost and silence. Urban factories and steam power seem far away, indeed. Keats has transported us to this whimsical world through the imagination, the second theme in this video. It is hard to overestimate the importance that the Romantics placed upon the imagination. It liberated the individual to dream and create works of art that were authentic, and it stood in opposition to the pragmatic reasoning of science, or, as the Romantics would have called it, natural philosophy. In 1817, Keats wrote, I am certain of nothing but the holiness of the heart's affections and the truth of imagination. That certainty, however, did not go unchallenged. In 1818, the works of his own imagination, particularly Endymion, were panned by the critics, while the trials of real life became all too apparent with the death of his brother Tom. In the following year, Keats penned all of his greatest works in a burst of creative energy, but without the idealism that he had once expressed. He had grown increasingly aware that the imagination, although the very lifeblood of romantic poetry, could lead to heartbreak, disappointment and frustration. It may provide a temporary respite from reality, but at some point you had to return to earth and it could be a very rude awakening. The limits of the imagination became a key theme in Keats's poetry of 1819. Let's return to the Eve of St Agnes, which was written in that year. From the title, we can deduce that the poem is set on the 20th of January, the evening before the annual Christian feast day that honours the patron saint of chastity, St Agnes. Superstition dictates that on this night, virgins will dream of their future husbands, and thus Madeline broods inside the castle, excited for the nighttime visions she will receive. Keats is setting up a comparison between the Porphyro that she will picture in her dream and the actual Porphyro who is stealing into the castle to find her, a comparison between imagination and reality. We can assume that both Madeline and the reader expect Porphyro to be a knight in shining armour, a gallant hero who is courteous, honourable, kind and noble, the very flower of chivalry. Yet as the reader follows his journey into the castle, he fails to conform to this heroic ideal. There is no doubt that Porphyro is brave, but he is also reckless, myopic, and morally questionable. He is a force of burning energy, while his heart is linked to a chain of likewise destructive images. It's on fire, contains a riot, and is compared to a feverous citadel. His plan to find Madeline is dubiously called a strategium, a mere sexual conquest, and so perhaps we cannot entirely dismiss the jibes of the belle dame Angela when she mocks Porphyro as cruel and wicked. When the sleeping Madeline thus awakes from her dream of Porphyro to find the real one besides her, she experiences a rather nasty shock. The transition from fantasy to reality is described as a painful change, as the blisses of her dream are expelled and she begins to cry. To her, the actual Porphyro appears pallid, chill and drear, the long vowel sounds here forcing the phrase to literally drag. Porphyro is no longer a force of fiery energy because compared to his ideal dream counterpart, he is morose and sickly. The reader may well feel a certain identification with Madeline at this point. Like her, our expectations of the knight in shining armour have been thwarted. Moreover, the reader is condemned to relive this fall from an imaginary world when they finish the poem and are forced back into reality. In other poems of 1819, we find Keats continuing to grapple with the value of the imagination. In Ode to a Nightingale, the bird and its music can be understood to represent the imagination and the wondrous art that it produces. The narrator longs to follow the bird into the dreamscape of the woods, but is unable to leave the mortal world where men either grow old or die young. There is no flight of fancy powerful enough for a person to physically escape from their own mortality. We thus arrive at the third theme of this video, desire and death. It is only to be expected that death is a looming presence in Keats's work. 
His mother, father and infant brother all passed away before he was 15 as Keats nursed another sibling, Tom, through tuberculosis until Tom died in December 1818. Keats contracted the same disease himself and, after experiencing bouts of ill health for several years, in February 1820 a particularly violent fit of coughing brought up blood. Keats turned to his friend Charles Brown and said, It is arterial blood, that drop of blood is my death warrant. Having both trained in medicine and nursed Tom through the same illness, Keats knew with an appalling level of clarity the untimely end that awaited him. He died at the age of 25. The tragedies of a lifetime impressed upon Keats's poetry a sense that death is always lurking around the corner. Mortality is thus a major theme in his work, but one that is frequently tied to another. Sexual desire often appears as a precursor to death in his poetry, or at least a precursor to a death-like state of cold, desolate emptiness. Keats links an act of vitality associated with warmth, passion and the creation of life, and its opposite, the final bite of mortality. In the eve of St Agnes, we last saw Madeline waking to the real Porphyro and finding herself disappointed. She then beseeches him to become like the immortal figure of her dream, and, veiled in imagery of stars, roses and violets, they consummate their relationship. Keats then instantly flips to images of death and darkness. The first four lines of stanza 37 toll like a repetitive bell, calling the pair back to mortal reality. Tis dark, this is no dream, tis dark, no dream. The enchanted world of the castle almost seems to melt as the lovers flee into the rising storm. A lamp flickers, a tapestry flutters, the carpets rise in the wind. Porphyro and Madeline glide like insubstantial phantoms, as their passionate union has rendered them little more than ghosts. They pass through the door, and, in a line filled with abrupt, monosyllabic words, their story is flung into the past. And they are gone, aye, ages long ago. The reader knows that they have fled into the cold, cruel landscape that Keats described at the beginning of the poem. Mortality is the final note as Keats describes the demise of Angela and the cold ashes of the beadsman. This almost circular structure, beginning with a desolate setting, moving to a story of sexual desire and returning to a desolate setting, is also found in La Belle Dame sans Merci. A woebegone knight is found loitering in a bleak landscape, he recounts his tale of seduction and his narrative ends with him waking on the cold hill side. Lovers in Keats's poetry rarely receive their happily ever after. On that note, it is time to summarise. Firstly, we saw that Keats turned to the natural, sensual and medieval as part of the romantic impetus to escape from the industrial age. We have also explored Keats's growing recognition that escape is not possible in a full and perfect sense. The imagination can transport us to fantastic worlds, but only fleetingly, and only to leave us disappointed when we return to Earth. The final reality that awaits us upon Earth is death, a key theme in Keats's poetry that often appears as a consequence of desire. Of course, there are other motifs in his work, and far more ways to interpret the Eve of St Agnes than the reading given here. Keats's ornate language leaves plenty of room for multiple perspectives. For instance, while I have reached a cynical understanding of the poem as a piece that centres around dubious characters, punctured dreams and the surrounding presence of death, you might reach a more idealistic conclusion, citing the fairy tale trappings or the devotion of the lovers to flee into the storm together. The lack of one straightforward answer is not, in fact, simply a byproduct of Keats's florid style, but an intentional aim of his poetry. To find out more about his quest for ambiguity and mystery, look out for the next video on his all-important concept of negative capability. Until then, thank you for watching.